Sharon is going to lead us in worship this morning. Let's worship the Lord together. As I was preparing this morning after we, we got the call, uh, the thought that was over and over in my heart that I just could not and didn't want to get away from was our God reigns. Our God reigns. There are so many situations in this congregation this morning as we shared our prayer requests. Those that didn't share but have heavy things on your heart, let's focus this morning, no matter what is going on in front of us, let's focus our heart and our spirit and our mind this morning. Our God reigns. We can have authority when we pray. Our Heavenly Father said, because our God reigns. Thank you, Jesus. Our God reigns. 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 
are children of the King this morning. One of my uh, husband's many brothers one day uh, showed up at the uh, shelter in the church, and the, it was a multifaceted building that my father-in-law had, and he came down the stairs from the men's dorm, and someone noticed him that uh, didn't know him, he hadn't been around for a while, and he came down those stairs, and they were questioning, why are you here, why are you, rightfully so, and he said, my father owns this building, and that just settled that. We have to remember sometimes that we are children of the king, and our father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He has the answer to every situation that we face. And when we pray, we can pray with authority, not only in humbleness to the Lord that his will be done, but we can pray against those things and the enemy that is around us. And when we find that verse and that authority, our Father said that we will have the victory. Our Father said we can claim the victory. Our Heavenly Father said that we can have that victory that we need next week. Our Heavenly Father said, let's rejoice this morning. We are children of the King, the Almighty God.
Amen. You may be seated. There's an old song, and if Don was here, I'd have her help me sing it. In childhood, I heard of a heaven. I wondered if it could be true that there were sweet mansions eternal up there somewhere beyond the blue. I wondered if people really go there. Then one day, sweet Jesus came in and I caught a vision of heaven. My soul in all heaven I'll spend. The chorus goes, heaven, happy home above. Heaven, land of peace and love. Oh, it makes me feel like traveling on. Up to heaven, eternal. Heaven, supernal. Oh, I'm so glad that it's real. Amen. There is a heaven to gain. There is a hell to shun. Hell is referred 162 times in Scripture. more times than heaven. Seventy times in Scripture where hell is identified and referred to, Jesus himself is talking. Seventy times. He talks of judgment 344 times in Scripture, sin 441, and death 456 times. Jesus talked more about hell than heaven in the numbers of verses in Scripture. Hell, to me, is the most uncomfortable topic to preach on. And yet of all the topics that Jesus taught on, it is the one he chose. Why did God make hell? And a very sobering question for me. Do I deserve to go there? And I regretfully have to say I do. In 2015, CBS News poll, the most recent that I could find on the subject of hell, 66% of all those polled said they believed in heaven and hell. 83 of the 66% in the 90, 1990s, that percentage dropped from 83% in 2015 to 66%. I'm going to see from 1990s to 2015, the people polled on whether they believed in a heaven and a hell dropped significantly. Of those 66%, that believed in heaven and hell, only 51% believed in hell. It's almost half, 50%, 49% of people who were polled said they don't believe there is a hell. More people believe there is a heaven. 
that might identify to us why we're seeing what's happening in our world. Because people who do not believe there is a final judgment and a place of punishment have no reason to do what is right. They do what is convenient or pleasurable or popular. Hell is a horrific place. Acts 2.31 says it's a place of disembodied spirits. We're told that Christ visited there in Luke 23, Acts 2 and 1 Peter 3. It contained historically a place called Abraham's bosom. Some people in religions refer to it as a place of paradise. But scripture says it is a place of torment. A place of for all future punishment, Luke 16. A place that exhibits the destruction and the absence from the presence of God. It's described in Matthew 25 as everlasting punishment, also as everlasting fire. Isaiah 33, everlasting burnings. Matthew 13, a furnace of fire. Revelation 20, a lake of fire. Revelation 14, fire and brimstone. Matthew 3, unquenchable fire. Isaiah 33, devouring fire. Matthew 25 says it's a place that was prepared by God for Satan and all his angels. Devils are confined there until the judgment day. Punishment of hell is eternal. The wicked shall be turned into hell, Ezekiel, or Psalm 9. Human power cannot be preserved uh, from it. You can't keep yourself from going there, Ezekiel 32. The body suffers in hell, Matthew 5, 29 and 10, 28. The soul suffers in hell, Matthew 10, 28. The wise will avoid it. They'll endeavor to keep others from going there. The society of the wicked leads to hell. The beast, the false prophets, and Satan shall be cast into it. The powers of cannot prevail against the church. That's a lot to be said about hell, and that's just a few. Again, it's Jesus who provides the answer to this question, is there a hell and do we deserve to go there? Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. And many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few If anyone would know, it would be Jesus. And his estimation is that the vast majority will enter the way of destruction and go to hell. And only a few will find the way to eternal life with Jesus. How many people are in hell? Jesus said many. And compared to the people who go to heaven, that's quite a comparison. Many, few. How many people are in heaven? According to Revelation 7, verse 9, too many to count. And yet the Lord calls them compared to the number that will enter into hell eternally, a few. Think about that a minute. The Bible says that those who will be in heaven are too many to count, that no man could number them, and yet they are few when compared to those who missed heaven and entered eternal damnation. If I would say to you, would you like some jelly beans? And you love jelly beans. 
I said, sure, I would love to have some jelly beans. In fact, you'd let to have a lot of them. But my granddaughters want me to take them to get some candy. They do not want me to keep the package. Pappy, did you buy that for me? Yes. Well, can I hold it? Yeah, here's one. No, Pappy. Can I hold the whole thing? Kingdoms. If I would put jelly beans in both my right and left pocket and ask you, which pocket has more, right or left? Obviously, if I had put the majority in my right pocket, the one I most often use, you would say, I want the ones from the right pocket. It has more. There's a psychological thing that Satan has done to mankind in making him feel there is safety in numbers. The majority of the world does not feel angst, anxiousness about hell. And the numbers are increasing with the passing of time. Fewer and fewer people believe there is a hell. And they seem to find some type of comfort and assurance in the fact that the majority of people do not follow Jesus. Do not believe in the God of the Bible. Will not surrender their will or life to follow Him. That thought of mankind that we're safer when we have more people with us. But how many understand the teaching of Scripture that you and God together alone are well able to overcome all the powers of darkness, trials and circumstances of life and be victorious? Just you and God alone. Allow me to share a description given by Timothy Keller. A common image of hell in the Bible is that of fire. Fire disintegrates. Even in this life, we can see the kind of soul disintegration that self-centeredness causes. We know how selfishness and self-absorption lead to piercing bitterness, nauseating envy, paralyzing anxiety, paranoid thoughts, and mental denials and distortions that accompany everyone who chooses to be self-indulged. And be careful here, because there are probably, percentage-wise, as many Christians who are very self-indulged as there are non-Christians. We have a faith, but we're still in control. We'll choose whether to set in a church that preaches conviction and the truth, or whether to go to a church that makes us feel good and safe and comfortable just the way we are. Now ask the question, when, what if when we die, we don't end, but spiritually our life actually begins? And what we are when we die will be the way we will be forever. How do you want to be forever? I sure don't want to be the way I am now forever. So I need God. The devil will take you just like you are. God says, I'm going to transform you so that what you will be forever will be better than you could ever imagine. And there will be no death, no sorrow, no dying, no pain, no suffering, no sin, no sickness, no aloneness, never parted again. 
Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Won't be going back east when we leave here to go to heaven. <laughs> Hell, then, is a trajectory, one of two, for the soul. Living a self-absorbed, self-centered life going on and on forever will bring you not even the hope that the world offers, that something may change. For when we leave this life, the way we leave it, we will spend eternity. In short, hell is simply one's freely chosen destiny. It is a trajectory that while spending your time on earth, you made insinuations and choices and pursued things that set you on the trajectory of eternal damnation instead of eternal life. We see this process prof- Uh, process when people choose drugs, alcohol, gambling, pornography. Uh, First, there's a disintegration because as time goes on, you need more and more. It becomes addictive. It begins to affect the way you think and the way you feel. You put your hopes and dreams in things that are at best risky. People who drive with their cell phones and try to text and make up and eat and all those kind of things while they're driving are making a conscious decision to gamble that they won't have an accident. And that if they do, it won't be bad. When we build our lives on anything but God, whatever we're building it on, that thing, though it may have good things about it, becomes an enslaving addiction that as time passes demands more, demands more of our emotion, more of our thought, and more of our finance, and more of our strength with each passing day. How many see that about life? Personal disintegration does not stop with death. It continues, the Bible says, we experience that disintegrating pain and suffering and loss and darkness and emptiness forever, forever, and forever and ever. Where the thirst is not quenched and the worm dies not, where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth forever, and ever, and ever, time without end. Hell, C.S. Lewis says, the greatest monument to human freedom. That's quite a statement. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. There's a monument built for people like that called hell. Romans 124 says, God gave them up to their desires. All God does in the end with people is give them what they have wanted their whole life. Including freedom from Him. Wow. Many people have said, I'm not going to sit and let any preacher preach at me. Tell me how to live my life. Don't have to. You have the freedom to choose. God gave you that freedom. But you need to be well aware of where that freedom is going to lead you. Isaiah 30, verse 33 says, For a burning place has been long prepared. Indeed, for the king, it has been made a really 
uh, it has been made its pyre deep and wide with fire and wood in abundance. The breadth of the Lord is like a stream of sulfur which kindles it. That's Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33. That's pretty clear, isn't it? It's a place of eternal hopelessness. It's what Jesus came to save us from. God was not willing that we should perish, but that we would have eternal life. God came us to save us from hell. For the believer, salvation from God's fury is a blessing that cannot be fully described. Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1.10. Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. It's coming. You and I who have faith in the Lord are looking for the coming of Jesus. But he says upon mankind and the world, his wrath is going to come. For the non-believer, the prospect of hell leaves us stunned while people are saying peace and safety. Scripture says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, Behold, suddenly destruction will come from afar as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Now, it's, it is my least favorite of all things to preach about. And yet Jesus spent more of his teaching about it than anything else, which says though the majority of churches do not ever talk about hell, judgment, and damnation. It is something Jesus focused on while he spent his ministry years trying to get the mankind on earth at that time and his disciples and people to come to prepare themselves for what was going to happen. I won't read the passage, but Luke 16, verse 19, through the end of the chapter. You need to read that today. Tells the story of Lazarus, the rich man and Lazarus. The key point of the story is the rich man says, Would you send Lazarus, send someone to tell my family, my loved ones, of what has happened? And could you have them bring, and ultimately the story goes, even one drop of water to touch my tongue. And scripture identifies heaven and hell in the story. And he says there is a gulf fixed between them that no one can cross. Important story. Then when you finish that this afternoon, if you turn to Matthew chapter 10 and read verse 26 through 33. Very important passage when we're talking about heaven and hell. Why do pe people struggle with faith in God? And, and, and let's just limit that question. Why do Christians struggle with faith in God? Why do we struggle keeping the commandments, following the statutes and teachings of the Lord? One of those questions was, if God is all love, then why would he send me to hell for eternity because I didn't honor my father and mother correctly? For that matter, why did he make hell in the first? Well, we, we, we shared that earlier in references that he created for Satan and his angels. When they rebelled against and tried to overthrow God, he created hell for them. Why would he send me there? A preacher named Vance Havner told a church member, told about a church member who didn't like sermons preached about hell. The member told him, preach about the meek and lowly Jesus. The preacher replied, 
That's where I got my information about hell, he said. And he was right. As I said, Jesus did more teaching on hell than any other subject he taught on. Secondly, we need to realize that hell is not a popular place for most people. Most people don't believe in it. A survey of Gallup in 2009 found that 86% of Americans believe in heaven, but only 59% in 2009 believed in hell. And now that's fallen. Jesus describes hell as a furnace of fire, a place of torment, everlasting punishment, a place of weeping and wailing, a place where there are cries continually for mercy. Hell is an undescribably horrible place. You don't want to go there. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus didn't talk about hell with just anybody or everyone. For example, he didn't talk about hell with the people that we would call sinners. Jesus, in none of his teachings, addressed his teaching of hell to sinners. He didn't mention hell to the woman at the well. He talked about a satisfying water that would cause her to never thirst again. Never brought up hell. Jesus didn't mention hell to Zacchaeus, the wee little man that everyone else hated and thought he was a crook, and he was. He even admitted, Lord, I've restored, (laughs) I'll restore fourfold whatever I have taken wrongfully from people. Jesus didn't mention hell to the centurion who he asked to have his servant healed. The centurion was a Roman and probably worshipped pagan gods. The, The guy was probably going to go to hell. But Jesus did not bring the subject up. Those were people that you'd think he'd talk to them about hell. I was brought up in the time and the era where true Pentecostal churches preached hell, fire, and damnation. Preaches so hot you could almost feel the flames, and I'd literally with my own eyes as a boy seen people jump up and run to the altar begging God, don't let me burn in hell. Because the message was so vivid that they wanted to be saved right then, not wait for the altar. No, instead Jesus seems to have focused his talks about hell to the religiously comfortable. Isn't that, I mean, oh my. People who believe in heaven, who believe in God, people who believe in his teaching, who are wanting him to work miracles for him, and he talks to them more about hell than anything else. Matthew 23, verse 33, Jesus condemned the Pharisees by telling them, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? These were the religious elite. And of course, he talked about hell to people who came to hear him preach and who probably believed they were okay Because they were good Jews. They were looking for the Messiah. And that Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds the elite righteous of the Pharisees, you'll never see heaven. What a statement for Jesus to make. At the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned of hell to the Jews that were there in the audience. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than the whole body be thrown into hell. He's talking to believers. 
He's saying, guys, you're living a life that's out of control. You're still trying to rule kingdoms of the world that should have fallen to my kingdom long ago. I need to be king of all your heart. He said, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body go to hell. That's Matthew 5. 29 and 30. I'd say Jesus is pretty serious about us understanding the gravity of choosing where we're going to spend eternity. Why would Jesus focus on the religious and comfortable? Well, because these were the people that needed to hear it the most. I've been in churches throughout my life where I've met some of the meanest people I've ever known in my life. And many of them held religious positions of leadership. Literally. You do not find the world treating their kind and people like them anything like the church treats its brothers and sisters. It's pretty frightening. There were days back in the early church, Paul writes to the Christians at Galatia, and he says, the works of the flesh are evident. He's talking to the church. Are you with me? Paul's talking to the church at Galatia. In the church, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. For God to take precious space in the word of God to give to the generations that would follow Jesus so that we would have what we need to know for him to have to put that verse and identify it was inspired by God to the apostle Paul to write to the Christian church at Galatia and it was the second time Does it give you pause at all? And for him to not just in a sermon say it, because I, Paul preached maybe thousands of sermons. But for the Lord said, I want that in the Word. Because people who believe me and call me Lord need to understand if you do these things, you will not make heaven. In other words, you're going to go to hell. Some of them were living like that because Paul had warned them before about it. Why, why would Christians live like that? Because I think that we forget that we are still flesh. I think that we forget that we need to live holy lives. That we need to come out from among the things of the world, the flesh, and Satan. 
and separate ourselves to godliness. The Bible tells us that God is a righteous judge. Psalm 7, verse 11, it declares, God is a righteous judge, a God who expresses his wrath every day. Whoa. We are really, we, we want to hear the love of God and, and the grace of God and the mercy of God and the blessing of the Lord and love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, and meekness, faith, temperance, and all the miracles and the signs and the wonders and all the blessings and prosperity and all those things that the church just loves to talk about and people love to hear and numbers will grow if you just do that. But notice what it says, and this is Old Testament. God is a righteous judge a God who expresses his wrath every day. How many have ever subconsciously just said, I don't like that? I don't like to hear that. I don't like that kind of preaching. I don't like that kind of talk. I don't. Talk about something positive, Pastor, please. Well, believe me, I, I put this off as long as I could. I don't want to preach about that. And I, I really didn't do a digestive understanding of Christ's perspective of hell. I didn't know until I kept studying that he talked more about hell than any other subject he taught. That startled me. It says to me that he felt like the church needs to hear this and be aware of it because it's the one thing that can keep them from getting to heaven. The former mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, uh, he thinks like most Christians and most people of the world. He told a reporter, it's, it's on video, I'm telling you, if there is a God, when I get to heaven, I'm not stopping to be interviewed. I'm heading straight in. I've earned my place in heaven. It's not even close. That was Michael Bloomberg. He is a very gracious giver. He supports thousands of things that help people, teach them, feed them, clothe them. He's a multi-billionaire. And he does give. But he is in danger of not making heaven because he's not going to allow any angel or Christ himself to interview him when he gets to the portal of glory. I'm going to rush right in because I have earned it. Can't, you can't earn it. I'm sorry. John writes to us in 20th chapter of Revelation, verse 11 and 12, Then I saw a great white throne in him who was seated on it. From his presence uh, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were open, and then another book was open, which is called the Book of Life. The dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Now, it's not like God that he doesn't appreciate it when we do good for others. Scripture teaches us to do that. 
But it's to be done not to gain points with God. It's to be done because it's the right thing to do when you have been blessed. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why you and I would deserve to go there. Maybe I more than you, probably so. But I know, and I can be honest with you, yesterday afternoon I was thinking, sitting quietly in the chair, And the thought came to me very vividly as it has often. If not for God's grace and mercy, I would not make heaven. You see, being a pastor doesn't gain you any ground or point. Being born again does. Being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit does. But no matter what you do or how much you do, no matter how good it is or how influential it may be, no matter what it does for other people or does not do, we will give an answer for ourselves when we stand before God. And His response to us will be based upon the choices that we make mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and financially. Because it tells where our heart is and who's in control. Martin Luther wrote, Jesus never died for good works. They're not worth dying for. But he gave himself for our sin. Because that would keep us from God. Acts 3.19 tells us, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that's why Jesus came to die on the cross, so that his blood would cleanse us from all our sins. Not just the glaring ones. Not just the ones identified by Scripture, but the thoughts, the motives, the feelings, the actions, the responses, the choices that no one else really sees but God. The why and the wherefore that could beset us in our final moments before we die. The point is, if heaven depended on self-righteousness, no one would ever make it. There was once a man named John who was as nasty as they came. He got drunk, got in fights, went to the red light districts. He cursed worse than a sailor. He was a sailor. He was a slaver. He kidnapped and sold human beings for price. Years before, he turned his back on God, but a vicious storm at sea changed his mind. Someone described the fearfulness of that storm as waves crashed over the boat, ripping away whole timbers from the boat itself. Clothes and beddings were stuffed into holes and boards were nailed over them. John joined those who were working at pumping water out of the ship and eventually when he was too weary to pump any longer, he was lashed to the wheel to try and steer it through a storm that looked as though it was going to kill everyone on board. One writer notes, in his heart, John believed Christianity to be true. But this brought him no consolation because he later wrote, I concluded my sins were too great to be forgiven. I waited with fear and impatience to receive my doom.
Heather called me Friday. She said, Dad, do you remember the story you told when I was really young? And I've never forgot it. And I said, what, what story? The story of the man that you were witnessing to and he was dying. He had been in an accident. He lay on the pavement inside the tunnel, Eisenhower Tunnel, just outside Aspen, Colorado. I knew he was dying. His head was gashed open, his brain was exposed, one eye was laying on the pavement, his side was oozing blood, there's no way to stop it. I asked him, do you know who Jesus is? I do. Are you ready to stand before him? Yes. Do you understand what I'm asking? Have you received him as Savior? No. And I won't. Why would you say something like that knowing that you're going to die? I only have one son. And when he died of drugs and alcohol that I exposed him to, I promised him, son, I will see you in hell. I shudder inside myself when I remember that. To have him made such a promise to a son who he exposed to the things of the world that brought him to death, that I will see you there. How warped and miserable can mankind become that we would choose the path of destruction? and walk away from the mercy of a God who says, I'm not willing that you perish. Let's finish the story about John. As soon as he heard that the belly of the ship had been emptied of water, he began to pray. And to think of Jesus that he had so often cursed and derided. I recalled his death, a death for sins, not his own, but as I remember scripture, mine and the sins of mankind. Did you catch that? He stayed awake from Christ because he had concluded his sins were too great to be forgiven. He didn't think God could love him as he was. But that storm brought him face to face with death and what he knew to be judgment, forced him to turn his eyes toward Jesus. And in that moment, his life was changed forever, forever. Do you know who that man was? John Newton. He wrote, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I blind but now I see there is a heaven to gain and absolutely a hell that we should shun
we need to trim our lamps, fill ourselves with the oil of the Holy Spirit, and spend some time getting refreshed by God that none of these things that we have discussed today will be a part of who we are and we will enter eternal life and miss eternal damnation. Father, today we ask you, Lord, for your extended grace and mercy. In this hour of our struggle, where this world has become increasingly dark and desperately wicked, where even the church itself, the governments of our world, and the vast majority of mankind, and even those who call themselves followers of Christ, have come short of your glory. Oh, Lord, would you awaken your righteousness in our heart, our mind, our soul, and in our bodies. Would you quicken us by your grace and mercy and through the work of your divine Holy Spirit to live godly in these last hours of time. Would you, Lord, help us to comprehend the gravity of Scripture and how your son spent so much time and emphasis on missing hell and gaining heaven. Would you help us, Lord, transition and be ready for the sounding of the trumpet in Jesus' name. Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but By faith, let's sing the last verse. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright and shining as the altars are open if you would like to spend a moment with God before you leave today. Dear friends, please take earnestly these words that God has had me share with you this morning. Do not shy away from the truth, but use it to discipline yourself to be prepared for the coming of Jesus. I believe that it is very close. Signs all over the world are telling us he's coming. He's coming. Be ready. Amen.